It began with the forging of the great rings. Three were given to the elves, a mortal, wisest and fairest of all beings. Seven to the dwarf lords, great miners and craftsmen of the mountain halls. And nine, nine rings were gifted to the race of men, who above all else desire power. For within these rings were bound the strength and the will to govern each race. But they were all of them deceived, for another ring was made. Deep in the land of Mordor, in the fires of Mount Doom, the Dark Lord Sauron forged a master ring, and into this ring he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. One game to rule them all, one game to find them, one game to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them. Tonight on the board, boys. War of the Ring. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Board Boys Podcast. It's season eight, episode four. Josh is having a baby. Cam is making a baby. He's in Peru. It's me, it's your board boy. Looks like meat's back on the menu, Ben, aka find the halflings for half off wings, aka Gothmog your face. And I'm joined by Man, you really made up for uh Campbell not being here. <laughs> that was amazing. I'm board boy. Bal Rob Pearson. I really wanted to say Bal Rob Rob, but I already put Rob into the Bal Rog, if you know what I mean. Rob Rob? Rob Rob. Anyway, like we said, it's just just us two, and here is what we did. We took the opportunity to play a game that is best with two people, so uh, moving away from Board Boy's tradition, playing with the wrong number of people, um, tonight's game was best with two people. And let me tell you what, what a game for two people it was. Yeah, man, spoilers. Before we dive into that, though, let's talk about what we've been playing. And everybody knows me, I haven't played anything. So, Rob, this is you. This is the Rob, the Board Boy Rob monologue, I think. Uh, I did want to also just kick in there that War of the Ring is the game I've had on my shelf the longest that I've never played. Uh, this my is fr- redemption. My this friend is Joe Brown, early year, early 2021 redemption right now. My friend Joe Brown, who I used to play games with like three locations ago for our Tuesday night games back at Cafe DM in Ankeny. Whoa! He works for UPS and he always was driving through like St. Louis, and so he actually brought me uh, a copy from Miniature Market, and it was like on super sale, and it's been sitting there for I'd say about seven years. And every time I'd look at the rule book, I would just be like, nope, even though Lord of the Rings is like in my top three IPs that I love, <laughs> I've just never been able to, to get into it. And I'm sure glad we did tonight. Rob has Lord of the Rings posters blanketed around him right now. Yeah. I. You know what? As part of this episode, I should probably like take some pictures around my house because I've got, I used to work at a He's movie. He's not kidding people. I used to work at a movie theater. And so I have like the two towers banner back here behind uh-huh. me. Um, I have glam drink Gandalf's uh, two hander in my office. We've got um, a cardboard cutout. I mean Gandalf's Gandalf right over there. back here in the corner. Yeah, I mean it is all over the place. So what have I been playing? I know last time I mentioned speaking about legacy games that we've been playing. Yep. Uh, one that we've been playing is Zombie Teens Evolution from Les Scorpion Mask. <laughs> Which those guys are great. Uh, they With a name like that. How could you not be? Yeah, they do tons of fun games like uh, Stay Cool. Yep. And uh, Zombie Kids was another one. Uh, they seem to make like fun, light, quick, like family type stuff, uh, especially for kids. And they really like us on our social media, so it's fun to interact with them. Zombie Teens. If you remember me talking about Zombie Kids, it's a similar game. It's kind of the follow up. Instead of uh, fighting zombies off at the school, you're now fighting off zombies across the town. And the mechanisms are similar. They're a little tighter, and there's a lot of stuff that gets unlocked as we play. 
this will be spoiler free what I'm talking about, but essentially you have to get four crates from the corner of the board and get them into the middle of the board. And you can do that. Your, your actions are moving, you're killing zombies, uh, or you can pass a crate from your location to an adjacent location. Pass a crate? Yeah, you have to pass the crate. Oh, I thought you meant like desecrate. No, no. So <laughs> if I have a crate and then you're standing next to yeah. me in the next space, I can hand you the crate. Right. And that's an action. Or you can take a crate from somebody in an adjacent space. So it's a lot of teamwork. It's been fun playing with Bo, and then Amy also has jumped in and played as, as well. I uh, played it once with Campbell, too. It's kind of cool. As you play with people, you're supposed to write their names in the rule book. And as soon as you play with, like, five different people, then you can, like, put a sticker in there. Oh, nice. It's really fun to put the stickers in there. It's really fun to go for the achievements. You can, If you win the game and you accomplish one of the achievements, you basically get to unlock stuff faster by putting more stickers down in, in the rule book. Um, we've unlocked a bunch of different rules, a bunch of different cards. I think we're about halfway through now. I'll bring, I'll come back and talk to you about it at the end how it goes. Also, when we're done, supposedly on their website, it says in the rule book that there's a way to put zombie kids and zombie teens together and like smash them together. And oh, Bo, and Bo is are all they going to come that. out with zombies, young adults, not sure what they're doing with their life, steeped in college debt? I mean, maybe. Edition. It's really funny the way. Minor spoiler: one of our favorite characters from the first game shows up in this game. We assume it's him because the art is very similar. And it's really funny. We named him Wet Chunk in our first game. We, we actually named all of our guys kind of based off the Goonies. Yep. And this guy had a super soaker. So that's why we called him Wet Chunk. <laughs> I've also played My City. And we are, let me think how far, how many games are we? We are 12 games into My City, which is approximately halfway. Uh, My City is a, another legacy game. This is by Reiner Knizia. The games last about 15 minutes each, so okay. we're playing like the two shortest legacy yep. games in the history of legacy games. Yeah. You might actually want to check this one out uh, for you and Sarah. Amy and I and Bo sometimes is playing it. He's not as into this one, but it's basically a polyomino tile laying game, and you're basically flip a card over, and it'll have a shape on it, and you, ha- you all have the same board you're working off of and the same... P- uh, building pieces and yep. they're three different colors and you're basically just trying to fill the whole board up yeah uh every game though scoring slightly changes depending on who got first second third and so on you're going to get to fill in circles which is like towards the end of the game like ultimately who wins and you're also getting stickers like if you lose you normally get something that benefits you uh, and, the okay. w- and the winner sure. doesn't or the sure. winner the winner gets the short end of the stick so it's kind of got a balancing thing, to catch like, up mechanism yeah like i didn't win the first seven or eight games but now i've won the last seven or eight games so it's uh it's really kind of balanced it out you basically get points for not covering up trees you lose points if you don't cover up rocks mm-hmm. you get points if you put the same colored buildings next to each other and I think at the beginning, oh, and then you get minus points for every like empty green space that you leave. And that's like game one basic stuff. Now it escalates and you start getting points for different things and it wants you to build your city in certain ways. But Sim City, the board game. Yeah, it's very fun. It's very inexpensive. I want to say it's like maybe less than $30. And I think you play it in sets of three. So like normally you'd probably sit down and be like, we're going to play episode one, which has like three levels in it. It's like basically three games and that's one whole envelope and you just pull it out and you read some rules for it. And it's just like, okay, game five, this is what happens. Game six, this is what happens. Game seven, this is what happens. And then you go to the next envelope. And if someone wanted to get that game and they lived in central Iowa, you can get that game. Where would they go? I know Barnes and Noble for a fact has it. Campbell actually got it to take it with him to Peru because oh, nice. I suggested it. I know Barnes and Noble may, might have a, like an exclusive thing to begin with, but ah. now I've seen it at other game stores and stuff. So you might be able to pre-order it from Dungeons Gate. Really, the last game I want to talk about because the other game I'm going to talk about is the main game we're playing because sure. I got I got to play it a couple times this week. Yep, uh, is Whistle Mountain. Whistle Mountain is from Bezier Games. It is. A worker placement game where you're placing your dirigibles. Dirigibles? They're like blimps. <laughs> okay. Uh, you got like a big blimp, a medium blimp, and then like a hot air balloon. And the theme of the game, I really, really need to read that part, but basically what you're doing is building a dam, but this dam is full of these machines. And you're building girders, 
So it's kind of also like a tile laying game. Uh-huh. And then the girders have resources on them. And so then you get to put your worker out somewhere on an empty space that isn't a girder. And then everything that touches, you gather those resources. Interesting. You also, once you once you have placed some girders, then they're, the buildings, I think, are like two by two, two by three. Or the, Sorry, the machines are two by twos, two by threes, and three by threes. And if you have like a three by three part of the girder, you can set, you can... If you've got the machine, you can do an action to build the machine on the board. And the machine is like a worker placement spot. So now you can put your dirigible on the machine and you activate that machine, but you still also get all the resources that you're touching. Oh, sure. Also, it activates all the machines next to your machine or next to you that you're touching. So as it it goes on. Yours or not? Yeah. You start just because once you you, you play it, you get points for it because you built it, but then anybody can use it. Right. And as soon as you build the machines over the dam, every time you do that, the water starts rising. And it's got a really cool, these like little water uh, strips of cardboard. And it's got, the, the game board is like a puzzle piece, like four, four, like four pieces. You put it together. And then you put these like little plastic pegboards kind of on each side to set the strips in that they have holes. Yep. And so then you have a stack of eight of them. And then you take the first one off the top. And you put the water on there. And like it's just as the water is rising as you go, as you take a strip off this, you just bring it all the way up. And then as the water rises, if any of your workers, because there's meeples here that you also are putting on the board, they can like uh, get washed away by the water and go down to the whirlpool. <laughs> and so then you have to like uh, pay pay gold to get them out of there. It's so like they're, sure. mi- they're minus points if you do that. So you're trying to like get your workers up away from the water and not let your guys drown. Uh, and then as soon as machines get partially covered, they're waterlogged and they can't be used yep. anymore either. So yep. every game is completely different because the machines are constantly changing. It's got the puzzle of how I'm going to build this these girders and how I'm going to place these machines. And then like... You're going to keep track of the water level and not yeah, get your stuff submerged. Yeah, it has a really fun game loop where the, con- the, the board state is constantly changing because the available machines and worker placement spots become different. And then where you place your stuff, like placing a thing and activating three machines and getting like six resources is just fun. Yeah. Like just getting a bunch of stuff is a fun thing to do. So Whistle Mountain, great production, great fun from Bezier Games. Go check it out. Right on. Well, speaking of um, legacy games, which you talked a little bit about, I would, I'd almost call tonight's game a legacy game because I think that every time you play it, you're going to add a 3D printed element to the board oh for war of the ring for war of the Rings. that's true so you mentioned earlier war of the rings has been on your shelf of shame the longest of any game uh, yeah for sure seven years and so um tonight you well tonight we're talking about you finally getting that um that shame thrown into the fires of mount doom I know, man. Or something. I mean, I love Lord of the Rings so much. When it came out, I was a freshman in college. Mm-hmm. I had already read the books in high school, I believe. Uh, I remember long rides in the car with uh, with those books. And then when they were making the movie, I was a freshman. And then for the other two movies, I actually was working in the movie theater. And that's why I have all the, yep, yep. the, the posters and merch around. But... Um, Man, I just I don't know something about it. The the high fantasy. I know Amazon is coming out with a series of Lord of the Rings. I guess it's more Middle Earth, but it's I think it's going to be set in the first or second age, whereas Lord of the Rings is set in the third age. Yep. So like this is like well, in the Wayback Machine. I'm curious to see what they're going to do with that. That's gonna that's gotta be sweet. I dude, I grew up watching Lord of the Rings. I, I mean, I read the books at some point, but. When the when they started cranking out the movies, I just ate that up. Um, we were talking when we were playing the game that, um, especially when they started coming out with the the all the DVDs and stuff. I I don't know if another big production had done as much like special feature behind the scenes type stuff as they did, but they were cranking that part out. So as much as I loved the movies, I watched every second of all of that behind the scenes stuff and so much of what they did and that movie was ground those movies was groundbreaking i think in a lot of ways for like physical effects oh yeah of like all i mean 
it not, still holds not as much up pretty. The, yeah, but like all that stuff was like they were they actually had guys making chainmail armor. Yeah, you know, like they figured out these processes, and so there's a lot of like cool just like crafting and like instead of figuring out how to do something digitally they're just like well let's just i don't know let's just make them (laughs) so that was always really really cool to see you know and just dive into that world of like they just for 10 years they just like that was so many people's life and i mean i would say that yeah i spent a lot of time diving into that yep and i mean and they filmed all three movies basically at the same time too which was really cool um if you have not seen it, I recommend checking out Josh Gads. Um, not Josh Lads. Oh, if only, have, he, if only he did it. He doesn't have a YouTube channel, but that we know about. No. And but, it seems like he would have talked about it after eight seasons of this. You'd think so. Yeah. But Josh Gad of uh I don't know. He does a lot of voice acting fame. Maybe uh he's Olaf the, there you go. the snowman. A frozen a frozen. Uh, yeah. Anyway, he has been doing a show on YouTube called Reunited Apart, which I hope like... Zoom I, has to be sponsoring that or something, well, I right? hope somebody... I know they're doing it for charities a lot of the times, but basically what he's doing is getting movie casts together on Zoom and just talking about like making the movie or like cool stuff that happened. And Netflix had done a series like The Movies That Made Us. Yep. And then they had like one other one they called the Christmas movies that made us yep. they had like Home Alone and Ghostbusters and I love I eat that stuff up I love listening about like the stories about how things were made like that and he did Lord of the Rings which was like one of the biggest groups of people that they had together which is trumped now if you're enjoying Cobra Kai side tangent <laughs> they did a reunited a part of Karate Kid oh jeez like right before the season three uh-huh. of Cobra Kai dropped uh-huh. and. That had the most people on it by the end because they started off with Karate Kid 1 and then they brought in Karate Kid 2 people and then they brought in Karate Kid 3 people. Yeah, just kept adding them in. They didn't get into the Hillary... Is Hillary Swank the next Karate Kid? Oh, I don't know. Or the... Whatever. The one that still had Miyagi in it. Okay. But whatever. That that one was not as good. But... (laughs) um, It was stricken from the record. Yeah. Sorry about that. They didn't bring those guys in. But anyway, the Lord of the Rings one is pretty great. It has everybody I think on. I I can't think of anybody they really missed out on. Uh, and there was a lot of good talk. And it was a pretty long one, too. I want to say it ran about 50 minutes or yeah. so. So I, I, re- I really enjoyed that. Because that's been like, w- when did Return of the King come out? Oh, man. I think they put up those out like every two years, maybe. Six. So if they went 2001, I bet it was 2003. And then I bet it came out, the last one came out in 2005. So in 2006, I lived for half a year in New Zealand. Really? Yeah. So my mom took us her sabbatical there. And so, like, I turned 16 in New Zealand, but so that was cool. So we, like... Did you get to see, like... Because I want to go there to see, like, the sets. We 100%. You can go check out Hobbit Town. Oh, yeah. We 100% binged watch all the extended editions all the way through um, in the scene where the hobbits are... They fall down the, the into the ravine, and they land on a, a carrot, and then a, a Nazgul's on the path. Okay. Right? Like, right when they first leave the Shire. Right. We went to th- we went there because that's just a walking path. Like so much of that stuff is like just based off of how crazy cool New Zealand environment culture is. Like that's all the- those places are just like normal places, but like to people not in New Zealand, they look like crazy movie sets. Yeah, timeline wise, that's about the time that I actually visited Australia for a month. And I'm kicking myself that I didn't go to New Zealand then, but I did go to the Sydney Opera House and listen to the Lord of the Rings music. Oh, nice! By like the actual orchestra and nice, stuff. Nice, nice. Uh, which was cool. I just fact checked myself. Lord of the Rings actually did it right. They popped one out every year. Really? Yeah, it was t- 2001, 2002, 2003. That's awesome. Jeez. They don't do that as much anymore. They do not do it's, that. It's anymore. usually like every two. Yeah. So. I'm just curious if they'll ever circle back and redo that. Like, I don't know, like another 30 years. Or are they going to be like, we need to redo Lord of the Rings? Or will that just stay as like the. I don't thing? know. I don't know. I mean. Like, Surya McKellen as Gandalf is like perfection. I, I just, I, I feel old when I say this, but I don't know how people could ever change it. How could you do it better? But in 30 years, people will be like, this is garbage. 
We can do it so much better now. It'll be all digital. And make that money. Money. Speaking of money, this game has no currency in it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) This this game, Onboard Game Geek, in the top 100, I'm not going to make you guess because you already know. I'm not going to guess because I'm looking at the answer. But It's in the top 20, right? It is number 12. Nice. It was released... 2012. Wow, I thought I it think. would be on here somewhere. I'm pretty sure it's 2012. I'm probably staring right at it. This is the second edition. Yeah. That was in 2012. First edition came out in 2004. The second edition came out 2012. Just so you don't confuse yourself, the second edition is ranked 12th. The first edition is ranked 121st. Okay. Although, so. uh, my buddy Jake, when he was like, let's learn this game, and he actually read the rules, he read the first edition Oops. rules instead. But I guess there's very few differences between the two, and we were able to figure, oh, figure those out. It's right. It says it, it says 2012 right there. Boom. Boom. Okay. So um, number 12 on the top 100, number two in the war category, and number six in the thematic category, uh, r- rating of 8.5. Best with two players, like we said, 150 to 1,000 minutes, somewhere in there. 13 plus and a fairly weighty game at 4.14 plus the box is big yeah yeah um okay so rob let's just talk about give me a rundown of kind of what we're doing in this game because it's not i mean two players is probably good because really there's only two factions in the game right this is on the and it's pretty async as far as powers As- no, not async. It's asymmetrical. It's pretty, it's pretty asymmetrical. Well, hey, I'm just playing the part here. Um, as far as powers, so um, t- tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so in War of the Ring, you were either playing the free people or the shadow folk. <laughs> They're not shadow folk. The shadow power. They call them the SP. The FP and the SP. Yeah, F- everywhere in my uh, thing is just FP, SP, the shadow power, I think, which... The free people, you know, are your elves, your dwarves, your various humans. It's interesting, the human side of things, they're even broken down into factions. Like, there's Gondor, there's the men of the north. Rohan. Rohan, the elves and the dwarves. I think those are the five free people factions. And then the shadow side, you've got Saruman's gang, you've got Sauron's peeps, and And then then you've got the, the elephant boys, or the Easterns and the Southerons. Yeah. Just kind of a weird thing, but that's where they come from, the yep. south and the east. Yep. They're all represented kind of by different colors on the map, and that's where they all start. Uh, War of the Ring is played over a sequential number of rounds until some, but one of the sides wins. The shadow side can win by either corrupting the ring bearer. There's a corruption track that goes up to 12, and if that corruption marker hits 12 by the shadow person successfully hunting the ring then the shadow player wins. The shadow player can also win by scoring 10 military points by taking over 10 points of power of cities and strongholds on the board. The free people can win by getting all the way to Mount Doom with the ring and dunking it before getting corrupted. As you would. As you would. And the other way they can win is by scoring four points of military might, which you'd be like, oh man, they only got to get four? Well... The Sauron forces are much stronger than the Free People forces. Uh, the game is played over a series of rounds. It starts off by drawing some event cards. Cards are really big in the game. You use them for a variety of things. Then there's a fellowship phase where you can do some stuff like the fellowship can change their guide who's guiding their party. Because in this game, there's a stack of cards and the top one is your guide. And you can actually send people out from your fellowship to do different things on the board for you. And then you can also declare the fellowship, which basically lets you, as you move in the game, you're going to be moving on this track to show how far you've moved. This has a similar mechanism to hunt for the ring to where your location on the board has a miniature, and that is where you are for game purposes. But theoretically, if my movement has gone up to five, I can be up to any five spaces away from my current spot. So and that's representing you or the fellowship or the ring bear moving around yeah. with the ring on Sneaking so they're around. invisible. Yeah. 
And you want to do that because if you declare, that's better than you getting successfully hunted and revealed that way. Uh, because declaring lets you actually stop in a safe zone, and in safe zones you can actually heal a point of uh, corruption. Then the shadow player is going to do a hunt allocation. This game uses dice for their actions. The dice all have different sides which correlate to actions in the game. The, the There's a hunt box on the board, and the shadow player will take as many dice as he wants. If I, if I had moved any time in the previous round as the free people, they have to allocate at least one dice. If They can allocate up to as many dice as I have, as the free people have, um, p- members in their fellowship still. Those dice are going to help if uh, the, the free people move. That's going to be how many dice up to five that they get a roll to successfully find the ring bearers mm-hmm. and uh, reveal them, which is bad for the ring bearers for multiple reasons. Then there's an action roll. You roll all your dice. The shadow player has more dice most of the game than the free people. Um, you can gain dice by adding in special characters. Uh, the free people can get up to six. You can lose dice by getting those special characters killed. You, you can. So you start with free people starts with four. Shadow player starts with seven. Yep. And the shadow player can get up to ten dice. Free people can only get up to six. Mm-hmm. Then we do action, re- action resolution starting with the free people. And you basically go back and forth spending a dice. If you have less dice than your opponent you can actually pass and see what they do and then at the end of the round you're going to just check for victory the dunking the ring and the corrupting the party or corrupting the fellowship those victory conditions happen immediately these two victory conditions for military though are only checked at the end of each round you see if the free people have four or the shadow player has ten so you get a little bit of like a a chance to one last dive for dunk in the ring kind of yep. thing. And there's lots of little niggly things with these, which each thing I'm going to go over some high level stuff. The action dice, you can, there's a character side, the character di- side basically lets you do different things, whether you're the shadow player or the free people, but it basically has to do with the characters on the board. There's an army side, which lets you move with armies or attack with armies. There's a muster side, which lets you recruit new troops or move down the politics track, which I will talk about in a minute. And then there's an event thing that lets you either play an event card or draw an event card. The free people have a wild side of the dice, which is called Will of the West. And then the last side of the dice for the shadow player is the eyeball, which if you roll, if you, you can assign the eyeballs to the hunt box. But if you roll an eyeball, you also assign that to the hunt box. Yep. There's the politics fa- the politics in this game are interesting because there's two things. One, your faction, the shadow players' factions all start active. The free people's factions all start passive except for the elves. There's also this track, and at the bottom of the track is at war. Until you are at war as a faction, and you have to be active to also be at war, uh, you cannot move into other people's territories, attack, or muster. It's a lot easier for the shadow player to do that at the beginning of the game because they're already active and very close to war. Yep. The free peoples are farther away, so the free people player has to actively try to get their stuff to flip to active and get their stuff moved down to start being able to muster troops to be able to save themselves. The interesting thing on troops is the shadow player has unlimited armies. That's right. The f- you can make as many orcs as you want. All them orc babies. The free people, though, if your free person unit dies, it is gone. Put it back in the box. You can't recruit another one. Melt it down. Melt it down. It's a legacy game that you can play once. Yep. And then there are there's battles to be had. There's movement. You can actually go into sieges which i think we'll talk about more in the review but you can basically go and hide in helms deep and those mechanisms for fights change there which carries like pretty thematically i would say you know from the from the movies from the lore yep and then the game also changes a little bit once you get into mordor as the fellowship uh the last thing i'm going to talk about is the actual hunting so if uh, the fellowship moves during the turn the shadow player gets to roll dice if they roll a six, then they successfully get a draw. They successfully did the hunt, which lets them draw a tile out of the bag, which can reveal the fellowship. It can also, it also will corrupt the fellowship, 
And there's actually some special tiles on both sides that can get put into that bag once we get into Mordor. Um, but that is that is the successful hunting is one way for the shadow player to win. And once you get to Mordor, you just draw a shadow tile or you draw a tile out of the bag every time every time they move. Yep. And so you really have to try to protect yourself once you get to Mordor. You can either taking the the damage, which getting up to twelve corruption is how you lose. Taking that corruption damage sig- signifies putting the ring on. There's also cards that that the free player can play that lets you discard that card to, to save it. And you can also just kill party members to protect yourself from the corruption as well. Right, because the only thing that matters more than the Fellowship of the Ring is destroying the ring. Exactly. So with all that being said, let's get to the table, play some War of the Ring, and come back with some thoughts. back all hope for middle earth is lost the fellowship has been destroyed the ring was reclaimed by sauron it's a dark time we live in yes i was so close the orcs too. run wild so close i was two steps away from the crack of doom or the butt crack of <laughs> the doom, butt if crack you will. of doom um you're 3d printing the butt crack of doom right now actually i am um so it, we did mention it earlier I played as the shadow power. Rob played as the free peoples. Um, and it kind of came down to the wire. I would say it came down to some dice rolls that may or may not have been within the confines of the rules of the game, but whatever. That's um, true. A little bit of dice roll, a little bit of pulling out of the hunt bag. Yep. Maybe some poor choices made on both sides. <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Um, so I, right. The shadow, the shadow powers one and, um, an, We'll just get into our initial thoughts. One of the coolest things about this game, this type of game, because other games do this as well, but um, kind of variable victory conditions, player to player, and then also you know each player has multiple ways to win or trigger the end of the game. So I won by getting 10 victory points by taking over 10 points worth of your strongholds or cities. Um yeah, I was able to keep my corruption in check corruption pretty well check. through cards and sacrifices. And then you were two spots away from Dunk in the Ring and Mount Doom and kind of threatening on getting your only, you know, four military victory points that you would have needed to win as well. Yep. My initial thought is I can't believe I've waited seven years to play this game. Um, it, it, it was a little daunting to begin with. I actually didn't play the read the rules before playing my first game. We kind of fumbled through it through some um, guides and uh, with Jake reading the rules. And I will tell you right now, go out to orderofgamers.com and print off the player aids for War of the Ring. Oh, yeah. They are fantastic. I always plug him when he's got the player aid for the game, and he came through on this one for sure. Uh, once again, that's orderofgamers.com. They are the best uh, at condensing down rules into readable player aids but yeah this game is lord of the rings in a box man oh yeah oh yeah very thematic um very cool to have both sides trying to do different things not just everyone's doing the same thing but they have different colored pieces a lot of i would say a lot to keep track of but not you know it's not overwhelming you you're doing a bunch of different things but um, you're rolling the action dice and you got to work with what actions you get. Um, so every turn y- you can, you can think about what you want to do and how you would achieve it, but ultimately it comes down to some, some dice rolling. And then, um, you know, even in the, the battles, you can be pretty confident in the size of your force or what combat extra cards you're going to play. Uh, but if the dice don't go your way, it, it, it may not work out. Yeah, I really like the fact, like you said earlier, that there's a couple ways to win. I would, I, I think that as the free people trying to attain military victory is pretty tough, even though I was kind of close to it. I could see if you could swoop in, you know, catch an army in the wrong spot. 
the moving in this game is kind of slow. Right. You I mean, you're going to see it coming because you're going to see some build up. And then besides besides Saruman and Rohan being so close, nothing else is really that close together that you're not going to have a couple of moves to see what's going on. And because you can't move an army more than one space around, there, you can't really surprise attack people that way. I could see, though, the other thing is that the Shadow Powers have a lot of strongholds, and they're all worth two apiece. So you only have to take over two. The other thing I could think is if you had taken over one of them, you would have really... I would have had to pivot towards defending whatever other ones you were closest to. So like you could have distracted or pulled my attention away from the ring being in Mordor. Like really yeah. Fast. This, and this is my second time playing this week. The first time I played is the shower shadow power and I won as well. Oddly enough, when the ring was on the exact same spot on the doom track, uh, our games went fairly different though. The free player, the free person player in the first game, my buddy Jake, he actually was was like, oh, I'm going to win militarily, which I didn't even think about him trying to do. And I did notice at the beginning of the game that like Moria and Gunderbat, I can't remember the other place in the far north that is a shadow thing. Those are each worth two points and they're not really heavily protected at the beginning. Yep. And so if the shadow player doesn't bulk that up early the free person could try to get in there and, and and take care of it. And the free people have kind of a lot of troops in that north area. They're a little spread out. But they do, but the, the other thing is they can't you actually can't, you move. You can't group that up until you get down the political right. track. So to do that, which is kind of genius the way they do this, they make you work for anything you kind of want to do. So you might be right next... The free per people are like three moves away from victory at the beginning probably they have a they have more troops than the shadow player and they're right next to some places they can take over except for the free people can't you move can't. or attack yep. um and they're much farther away like your first turn as the shadow player you can muster put sauron to war and start cranking at him and saruman also you can do that and go into rohan but as the free people you have to do muster actions to get yourself down and then you can't even activate yourself until someone attacks. So that's a really cool give or take because as the shadow player, you don't want to go willy-nilly attack a faction because that not only activates them, which it, is the hardest thing for the free people to do. It moves them down towards war And it war moves them down faster. because as the free person, if you want to activate somebody uh, a faction without being attacked, like you want to preemptively go out and attack yourself, you have to send someone out for, to the fellowship that can activate them and send them directly to the the stronghold there, and then and then you're an action to activate. You're using move actions to get that fellowship member over there, and you've broken them off the fellowship, so it's right. Which I think is good because you need to do. And that he didn't do a lot of that in our first game. You have to do a little bit of everything as the free peoples. You do. I think there's a little more to think about as the free people as far as trying to get yourself active and having to break out your party members because a lot of your event cards have to do with your party members being out and about mm -hmm. in, in certain locations yep. doing stuff, yep. which they're all events like from the movie kind of. Uh, like there was a cool one that I did end up using because it was pretty situational but you can basically make Aragorn grab the, like the ghost army and he he moves across maybe a quarter of the board and then just wipes somebody out in a location oh, like like the shadow people yeah it was uh it's a it's a it's a card that like you said very situational it'd have to be exactly right but if you saw that and threw that card out really take the other person by surprise because it's so it's so powerful if it just so happened to be yeah i think you were reading the card to me and it was like and this and this and this and this I was like, oh yeah I, a pro for me is i really like the event cards i think the event cards are cool they get off offer a lot of options there's two choices on them you can either save them for combat or you can use them for their first ability and the way you use them is genius too because there's a side of the dice that will let you play any card but they all all the cards have to do with one of the different actions so you can also take 
you could use a character action to play a character card, for instance. So there's multiple ways to activate those. And I think it's neat that both sides have different dice. Like the Fellowship or the Free People dice have two character sides, but they only have one army side, and that army side is shared with a muster. Yep. It's like a half and half, whereas your dice has its own army spot and it has an army muster. Yep. Um, and then my side also has like the Will of the West, which is used for specific actions in the game, but in general is just a wild card. So you have more dice, but I think my dice in that in the game were a little more flexible, if that makes sense. Just right. Just because yep. of that wild yep. side. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so it's just interesting in um, in terms of sort of resource management in getting your actions and it's it's going to be random every time because it's based off a dice roll um but just looking at what you want to do and how are the ways you can go about it and there's a little bit of the ability to you know re-roll some dice or change some dice both in the actions and in combat but it's not so much so that you can't you you're not just taking the dice at face value. So like you said, it was interesting to be able to play cards uh, you know, one or two different ways. Uh, but then as the shadow power player, you know, every time you roll the dice, you've got to first set aside some of I dice in case the fellowship's moving around. Like you want to punish them for that. But when you roll seven dice, they could mostly come up as eyes and then you'd be like super handicapped Right. On other actions like getting your army bolstered up, moving them around, you know, moving like Nazgul around. And then if you see that there's like six eyes over there, you'll just go, well, I'm not going to move this round. Right. The will they, won't they of the the moving and the hunt is really interesting. You kind of have to ride that line of like, let's put a couple over there to mitigate. And then like also like hope you don't roll more than two or three more. Right. But then as the fellowship player, you have to decide if you're going to move the fellowship or you're going to split off your party and move them or you're going to use them to move a character on the board. So you have to use your move dice for a lot of different things. Uh, and then just the way the hunt works where I think it's cool where if I reveal myself as the free people, as the fellowship, that's better than being found out by you. Uh, if, the, if the shadow people find you, it's really bad because not only that, uh, that, that opens you up to a lot of the event cards you the shadow player has. Yep. And you're limited on like the places you can stop in. You can't stop in safe zones. And the more times you move on a turn the more likely you're to be found out. So the first time you move is the fellowship. They have to roll a six against you. Then you put your blue dice in, in the hunt box. Then if you move again, they can hit on a five or a six. And then the third time is a four five or six. So the more you move, uh, the better chance they are. They have to find you. And then not all the tiles will reveal you, but some of them will. And a lot of them will, uh, they all will increase your, uh, your corruption yep yep another thing i like that we could get into is the combat so you've got regular side you know regular troops elite troops that sort of count as two regular troops in a lot of ways and then various leaders so like in the for the shadow people it's nazgul um obviously thematically for the free peoples it's a, a number of different people and those don't give you uh, military might so much as some flexibility in combat rerolls and then combat cards you play. Then obviously you've got the companions or the sort of the more of the, like the heroes, right? Or the actual characters. Um, and then if they're in with armies, they have abilities yep. and, and, and add yep. things there too. I think it's neat that they limit ten units into an area, um, and then the, that that limit is actual plastic figures. And it doesn't count leaders. Uh, it's interesting. Leaders can't actually, for the free people, leaders can't exist by themselves. So if an army gets wiped out, then the leader goes away. Uh, it's a little different. The Nazgul can fly around and just do whatever they want. Yeah. Uh, if you wipe out an army with a Nazgul in it, they do go away. Like, like That's the only way to get rid of them. But I can, the very next turn, you could pop you, more in. You can in. just pop them yeah. back in. Um, but the elite units, they don't roll more dice or anything. They just add more like HP value yep. to your army. And it also lets you continue into siege mode, which 
I think this is a very cool part of the game where if you get attacked, uh, there's a few different things. Normally in combat, you get a chance, you both can play a card. The attacker says, I'm going to play a card or not. Defender says, I'm going to play a card or not. Then the, yeah, I think that part is like really straightforward. Of, right. Okay, I attack you, you defend, we both roll. Right, and then you simultaneously rolling dice. So if, we, if it's 5v5, we can both roll up to five dice. And then we both will re-roll depending on what our leadership values are between our characters and Nazgul and leaders. You can re-roll up to five dice again there. And then in a normal open field battle, fives and sixes hit. In a battle where there's like these two areas where fortifications are on the board, which is kind of thematic, like one of the fortifications is in Osgiliath which you, they're like the shadow players basically crossing that river yep. and having to get in there. The first round of combat, the attacker in, into a fortification area or a city, they only hit on a six. And then every other round they hit into a five, no matter what in combat after uh, you, you have to fight the first combat always, no matter what in those situations. And then you get a chance to retreat or stop the attack. Now, if you're in a stronghold and get attacked, why don't you talk about that, Ben? Because I think that yes. is that, that is did an that interesting feature. Yep. Yes. So if if say if the shadow people or the shadow armies were moving into uh, Minas Tirith, I use uh, an army action to come in and say, okay, I'm going to attack, and your response can be, well, well, I'm going to I'm going to bunker down. It's going to we're going to go into siege mode here. Right. I either bunker down or I fight. Right. If, if, you, if, if, if you, I fight, you don't move into the zone yet. Yeah. If you bunker down. That sort of like dead ends my move. Right. That just stops the attack right there. But you do come into the zone and I go off onto the side of the board where they have all of these little boxes with the different strongholds on it. You've locked yourself down in the city. Right. And then in there I can have only five units. So I thought it was interesting that that sort of, can I say blocks? Sure. The attack. So like I've used, like I've gotten my army ready to go. Okay, we're going to attack, and boom, I've, in a sense, wasted an army action right? because I haven't actually gotten any productive attacking of your guys but done. But it feels like siege warfare, right? Because, I mean, we've all seen the battle for Helm's Deep. Yep. That only lasts, like, 90 minutes in the second half of the Two Towers movie. Yep. So, I mean, it takes quite a while for it to happen, and... I think it's neat that you can't take all 10 of your guys back in there. So you might sit there and fight for a while and then retreat. Leaders don't count towards that so they can come in. When you're being sieged, you can only be attacked once per dice action. Unless here's another reason to have elite units. You sacrifice an elite unit and replace them with a regular unit. And that lets you go again instead of... Like when I didn't do that as much as you did, you got way bigger armies than I was able to, which I think was the right way to do it. Yep. You got to come with a big army and know that, okay, you're going to take losses from critical roles. And then you're also, if you want to continue the siege, you're sort of giving up a guy every time as well. So, right. The, to utilize for an action. Yeah. My first siege of Helm's Deep fell on its face because I think you, I got some bad roles, you got some good roles. So right. you were hitting. Plus, I hit on a five or a six, yep, and I only hit on a six. You were hitting my army, and I tried to keep it going, so I was using up another guy every time. But playing those combat cards is really huge at the right time too. Like making sure you have the combat cards that can help you. A lot of them increase your rolls or give you different benefits or surprise or screw with the other player. Um, I think as the shadow player, getting the Witch King out early. Are utilizing yep. the Witch King in most battles is important, which, since he's a Nazgul, you can fly him around like, okay, I'm going to fight here next. Uh, the Witch King's got a cool ability where you, he basically replaces the combat card you used in the first attack every round. Yep. So he's so just got a crank, and you're just cranking cards out. He's pretty nifty. Uh, I think it's neat that the the sieged in player can also do like a sortie and like come out and attack him and try to like drive him out too. Uh, it it's very uh, the, the combat is very thematic as far as that goes. Whether you like dice rolling as a combat mechanism or not, that might make or break it for you. But I think it's good enough, and there's enough card play in it, and there's enough strategy to where it, the defender has a leg up, which they probably should have sometimes, and you can retreat and other things to make that a good thing. Oh yeah, I definitely spent. I mean, I spent. 
a bunch of turns just trying to like gather up bigger armies to because they knew you were going to go into siege mode and it was going to be a whole drawn out thing. And if you didn't have that, I I think that that helps balance the game out. Oh yeah, cuz otherwise you just steamroll right. military. Yeah, there's so much balance going on in this game. I mean, and and it just shows the two games I've played played out very differently and the results were very close. I'm not sure. I'm sure there's games of War of the Ring where one side can maybe just totally steamroll the other side. But so far in my plays, they've seemed very, very even. And I know some friends that have just started playing War of the Ring as well. And I think the free people have been winning their games, which I find interesting. Because so far the shadow player has has barely edged out both of ours. Although we have we have played a couple of minor rules wrong um, in both games so far that... The last time I think helped the shadow player a little bit, but oh, definitely. So it, when we played, we didn't get the limits or the restrictions for dice rerolls right, which played in my favor because I was just bringing a ton of guys with me to reroll dice. So right. we had it capped at five, but it was also supposed to be capped at however many dice you were rolling in the first place. So just because you had one dude and five Nazgul doesn't mean you can just keep rerolling dice. Yeah, and I also like the the fellowship side of things where you get to choose who your leader is, and that's important, and being able to like strategically send your guys out, and it's kind of cool if like all the fellowship is gone, then Golem becomes your leader, and he's kind of abilities too. Just the, the moving of the fellowship, the hunting for the ring, the whole thing when you get to Mount Doom and Mordor, the battle system's cool. I, I could just keep gushing about this game, but I, what, you got anything else before we move into maybe some prawn cons? Uh, no, I think we've hit all my high points. What do you got for cons? Uh, I think one of my cons is maybe the artwork. Like the game board kind of looks like it's older and I don't know. It's not pretty. It's I mean, it's, it's functional. I think uh, that and the units, some of the units are so similar, like the free people's units all the elites, except for the dwarves, are basically horseback. The leaders are on horseback with different banners. On the board, it's really hard to tell who's who. And it's important, especially like in a mixed army, because maybe this faction's not at war, but this one is. Sometimes or, or there's this bonuses one's not for mixed armies. Or like the, you had a card that you could hit me when it was a mixed army. Right. So just telling the difference between the different free people factions... The different Sauron factions aren't quite as bad. The two or like the Saruman orcs regulars and the the Sauron orc regulars, very those close. two are very close. Like one's got like a spiky shoulder pad yep. and the other one doesn't. I'm personally fixing that by 3D printing bases for all of them. Uh of the different colors of their starting things. You mean you're not hand printing all of them? No. I know a lot of people have, have painted the bases yep. too. I think that's a good idea. Um it's not a ton of work. The the there's on Thingiverse there's some three D printed bases, uh, or you know just grab your paintbrush and do those up. That was that was one of my cons. The other one is, as far as the game structure goes, I think it's fairly easy. Like, what you do on a turn is not hard, but there are a lot of little exceptions, this is and that's that are just. Hard to catch. Like we played twice so far, and we played a couple things wrong each time. And if you're a rule stickler, I can see why that's a big deal, and that's gonna like draw the game out. If you're not, I feel like some of those things you could kind of just get a feel for what felt right, and the game was still fun. Like I've had fun both times playing this right, game, right. even though we were probably only like ninety-five to ninety-seven yep. percent accurate on what was going on. It was still fun. Both plays were longer than their two to three hour time frame that they've got on their website, uh, or maybe it's three to four hours on the website. I can't remember. But it was two to three on on BGG. On BGG is two yeah. to three. I think that though, if you both people knew the game, I think you could probably play this game in that amount of time. So, I yeah, that was the thing is I didn't you know obviously you explained everything and the the player aids that you talked about were really very useful. Um, I mean, One thing I did a, for sure was I set 
there's a thing in the center that shows what each of your actions do. So after I rolled my dice, I just sorted them on that so I could remember like oh, sure. what each because like to me I thought the muster and the army icons were kind of on the dice look. Similar, they look similar at first, and it's kind of tough playing between the two because the free people dice, yep. their army banner looks different yep. than the shadow, so uh, you kind of got to get used to both of them. So, I just thought like that part was fairly straightforward once you understood it. There, other than that, like every card has like it was just so much reading, you had to read the card and like, okay, but it only is if X, Y, and Z are happening, or so and so's there, not there we're at right. war or not at war so you get to read the card understand what it says and then look at the board okay where's this place or does this card apply right now that's a big thing and you okay well all right so this top action either can't work the rest of the game because that already happened or not yet okay now i have to evaluate the card do i want to keep it for the the bottom action you know the combat card action and if I do, like, what's the scenario where that would be important? So I, do I need to set up that scenario or just keeping that in the back of my head so that, like, if we're going to a, in a, into a combat, I go, oh, here's a card that would be really good for this situation. So it's I think that's more of a prawn for me. It's, like, just a lot of reading to sort of take in the number of cards. Right, and I could see that, but, I mean, like, that was one of my maybe pros was the, the cards. I, oh, I agree. But, but, like, maybe that's where some of the weight comes from. Oh, a hundred percent. But the thing is, on my second play, even though I switched and played the other side, I think once you've gone through the game one time, you pretty much kind of understand the cards. You, like you probably see seventy five percent of the cards in a game anyway. And once you kind of have seen one, especially the, a lot of the combat ones are similar. Yep. A lot of the other ones, once you, I think once you play it once or twice, the cards become more like second nature. And I feel like my second play, even though I was playing with a completely different deck of cards, it was kind of like second nature. Now, as far as where stuff is on the board, you are going to get your middle earth geography down, oh, yeah. son. Oh yeah. Because a lot of times you're like, okay, uh, I don't want to give up like where I'm talking about, but do you know where Nern is? <laughs> so just trying to figure out like where the thing is on the board can be hard sometimes, especially when you're setting up, which is kind of another con for me. The setup on the game is a little bit of a beast. I think it'll be better if both people know the game and you get going on it. But just like in this region gets this many leaders, this many elites, this many... And, it's the rule book is really good at going through and setting all that up. And actually, even though the rule book is almost 50 pages long, I think it's set up to jump back into maybe a pro. The rule book does a really good job of teaching the game. I think it really breaks it down into the different sections and gives a nice overview and really hits everything. And with these player aids that I have printed and the game comes with a pretty decent player aid too. I think I don't really need the rule book anymore anyway. Mm -hmm. And I, even if I haven't played this game for a while, I should be able to just check out this quick, you know, double-sided player aid, which I know there's like 10 of them on the table here, but a lot, of, a lot of them are our, like based yeah. on characters and this or that. Yeah. Set up, set up is kind of a beast. Teaching I think is kind of a beast because you have to teach. This isn't a game where I, you can kind of get started, but you really need to understand most things pretty well. There's certain things that you could kind of gloss over, like we could worry about combat when we get to combat. Just know you want to have a lot of guys. I think I was able to impart a lot of wisdom to Ben on our first play, on his first play, just because I had played the Shadow Player once. That's why I picked it. And I was able to be like, okay, here's what I learned the time I played it, and I think you had an easier time with some of the yep. stuff than I did. Honestly, here's my one pretty big con. Um, some of it has to do with the artwork, but like, the board was in two chunks and I think that having a, like a more deluxified board would have, I'm just saying like, not saying like, okay, you're 3d printing some mountains right now, but like that would help. But like the, if the board fit together and like, wasn't sliding around and then like, right. If there was just, you know, there was just some stuff where like, it's got a pretty big table presence, but, you know, we had to be careful to not bump the board or like s scoot big armies out of the way. So there was just some of that that was a little, I don't know. Yeah, it does spindly. I mean, it, 
to take care of some of that issue, it does have like these army markers where you can basically take your army off the board, put it on the side of the board in this box where it's got one, two, and three. And then put your army marker on the board because sometimes your armies get so big, like figuring out how many of your army are in this one zone compared to another zone can be kind of hard. So I think that's good. But then on the other hand, you kind of got to be like, okay, this is army marker one. Which of those armies are over there? Because you had a lot of guys. Yep. Like you were using all three of them at oh, one yeah. point. Yeah. So determining what was where uh, could be a little tough. Really seeing where the red is or where the black is for like the impassable mountains. Sometimes it was hard to see that because the guys were on the board. But like, oh man, I'm going to go here. Oh, I can't. I got to go around. Because there's mountains there. Yeah. So I, I feel you. Like some of the graphic design, it. It feels like a game that's like 10 years old or more. Which, yeah. Uh, another con is I don't think you can buy this game right now. Uh, it might be like currently out of print. My guess is it'll c- roll back around. I think there might be a new expansion coming out if we want to roll into maybe final finalish thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So, Rob, what are your final thoughts on War of the Ring? My final thoughts are I just constantly want to play this game now. <laughs> um, I'm really... I'm selfishly hoping that there's only going to be two of us for our next game night on, there you go. on Tuesday so we can play War of the Ring again. Or you know what? You can play it with three or four. Maybe I'll suggest we try <laughs> playing it that, that way too. I just want to explore it some more. I feel like there's a lot of different ways to go about this. I'm kicking myself that I did not jump in on the... I forget what it was called. It's not like the original collector's edition, but there was a deluxe edition that was like all painted stuff i want to say it was like four or five hundred bucks i'm like i've never even played this game i'm not gonna do it now i would <laughs> i've got tree beard coming from a bgg promo for it nice i've got 3d printing going on like they have like little the little mountain ranges which is gonna fix that con for me yep. is i'm gonna have like little 3d printed mountain ranges so you can see those on the board that you know those are impassable i've got 3d printed mount doom working on there to move up that thing uh, i don't think there's really no point for it, but somebody made a 3D printable Orthanc tower. Yep. So Sauron can like I sit saw on top of like it. Like a Helm's Deep uh, model. Yeah. So like I'm just gonna like print up those stuff. I think the the bases for the units will be cool, uh, and, and that'll help too. There's a couple of expansions for the game: War of the Ring, Lords of Middle Earth, and Warriors of Middle Earth. I don't know what they add. Oh yeah, War of the Ring, Kings of Middle Earth is what's coming out this year. I would assume when Kings of Middle Earth comes out you'll probably be able to find this game again. My, my assumption is when they print an expansion like that, they probably printed more of the other expansions and the base game, and yep. those will all come out. And fingers crossed, maybe they're going to put out like a final, like new deluxe type thing, and I'll check that out if, if it comes down the road. But War of the Ring, I think I rated a 9.5 on BGG right now. We'll see where it stands when we bump or dump it in my thoughts then, but... I just I can't get enough of this game right now. I just want I want to play with everybody. <laughs> um, so for me, I would say that this game really reminded me of Star Wars Rebellion. So I mean, it's a asymmetric two two faction game, but it's super super thematic. So I I really enjoyed it. Um, as soon as you said that it was a lot like Star Wars Rebellion, I I knew I would enjoy it, whatever the outcome. So yeah, I I I really enjoyed it. I can't think of anything better to say about that yeah those things get compared a lot so i think we're going to talk rebellion versus war of the ring man i really don't know if i were to wanted to pick one because those are, those are two of my favorite ips i think though star wars rebellion tells the star wars story better than war of the ring tells yeah. lord of the rings i think it has to do with the cards you play in rebellion and like, I can remember games of rebellion where I'm like, Hey, do you remember when we turned Chewbacca to the dark side and then he killed Han Solo? And like, I, I remember those stories from that because like I'm making my own star Wars right. story up. Right. I, so far I, I haven't played it as many times as rebellion. I haven't got that quite that same feeling from War of the ring war of the ring, but it's close for me. I think right now I'm probably going to give the edge to rebellion, between the two, but if you ask me which one I want to play right now, I want to play War of the Ring. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not Cam. I'm not Josh. So it's time for Board Boys Bump or Dump. Oh, man. No song? 
Baby, turn around. I want to see that sexy board. You can go bump, bump, bump. Or dump. You did it. Or boing, boing, boing. Or boing, boing, boing. Man, there's been way less boing, boing, boing this episode. It. Mainly because Cam's not here. <laughs> All right. So what are we bumping or dumping? Well, back in 2019, we played Eldritch Horror. And on that episode, we had, I think it was Josh, myself, Cam, and a special guest, Joseph Roth. Joe runs a local business here, has been doing a delivery service as of late, but previously had been going to like bars and coffee shops and stuff and, set, and like running game nights for them. Hopefully we will be getting back to normalcy sometime in 2021, and I can attend more of his events at that time. Anyway, uh, back then, Eldritch Horror was ranked, uh, it had a 7.8 ranking, and it was at 61 overall. Ben, I know you've never played this game before. I haven't. But Eldritch Horror is also an older game. Uh, I think it was 2013. How do you think Eldritch Horror... Actually, let's play a little game. What do you think Eldritch Horror is about? Oh, <clears throat> well, what it is, is like a remastered, vis- revisited, uh, more heavy version of clue Mm, so close there are investigators in it though there you go so eldritch horror is a cthulhu mythos based game it's an adventure game you're basically trying to stop the great old one uh that you're playing in that game and it's cooperative best with four players we played it with four players so much like tonight's game we played it right on par you can play the game with up to eight people though do not recommend (laughs) So with all of that, do you think this has been a bumper or dumper? Well, we have decided that if it stays put, it was a bump because of how many more games have come out since then. So what I think is that it is a bump. You think it's a bump? Yep. Just to get one more perspective, I've got my man Cam here from Peru. (laughs) Cam says, what's up? Cam says, what's up? Hold, please. Insert elevator music here. Cam thinks the game is a dump to be diametrically opposed from your viewpoint, and Cam does. is correct. Oh, no. Is it's, it even on the top 100 still? It is. It's 81. Okay. It's dropped 20 spots. It is a 7.8 rank still. The only difference is it's had 4,000 more rankings, and it stayed the same. We're going to crack this BGG algorithm at some one day. point. One, yep. one day. We'll have a whole episode about I it. I mean, mainly it's because 20 more games went higher than it essentially anyway eldritch horror is still fun i've actually played it with Bo. he loves everything cthulhu and he likes cooperative games and now that he's reading this game is even more in his wheelhouse because the the actions are pretty simple if you heard us talk about mansions of madness or arkham horror this is in the same kind of okay. realm, yep. realm yep. as those things uh, eldritch horror is more on the global scale, though. So instead of just like running around the city of Arkham doing stuff, you're running all over the world, putting out fires and fighting cultists and stuff like that. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, it's good times. Okay, so hopefully one day we will revisit this game, War of the Rings, and see if it's been bumped or dumped. Man, if it's bumped, that'd be it'd pretty be, tough. That'd be crazy. Unless maybe the new expansion bumps it. Ooh. Or, which I guess is part of my final thought also is... I'm really going to look in to see what to, what these expansions add. Because yep. if it's not rules complexity, but just more stuff, I totally want it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Plus, then you, by then you'll have all the 3D prints done. Yeah, and man. And then they'll come out with the 3D board, and you'll be like, well, what's this? Rob, if people want to interact with us on the social medias, where would they find the ability to do so you can check us out on facebook at the board boys podcast on twitter at the board boys pod or the board boys podcast on instagram we uh, have a board game geek guild come hang out and chat with us there it's guild three four five five we really uh, apparently everyone and their brother has a discord channel now so i guess that's the cool thing we could we could do just because we need more time online talking with people there you go so maybe we'll do that but spoiler alert we have a TikTok now. Cam did it. From Piru? 
From yeah, I think he did it before he left. Okay. But I think we have one one one, one video out there. So for those of you that asked for it, which there were some, we did it. We did it. We did it. Well, Cam, did don't it. question us. Dab yeah. on the haters. Exactly. So until next time, we hope you like board games. This is not Josh Ladbone enough. Lay down your sweet and weary head. Night is falling. You've come to Jenny's end. We're here though. Um, and we are playing War of the Ring. This is Board Boy Balra Brog. Wait, that's not right. Let me try that again. I should have. Should I have introduced? I should have introduced yeah, myself yeah, first because it doesn't do flow. Okay. Why do you weep? What are these tears upon you? Baby, turn around. How's it go? I want to see that. I don't know. I don't even even know that song. I want to see that sexy board game go bump or dump. Or dump or bump. All right. I think I did that. Bump, bump, bump. You're only sleeping. What can you see?